today to celebrate the, the life of my father, Martin Newman. And while it's very sad and it's a tragedy, Dad wouldn't want us to be sad. So I'm going to try my very hardest to commemorate him in the way he deserves. I've been writing this for about two weeks now and still feel like it's not quite right. But I hope to do you justice, Dad. You are all here because you knew my father in different ways. And I'm sure you can all share some wonderful and perhaps inappropriate stories with me, and I look forward to those. But I want to tell you about my father from a daughter's viewpoint. As an only child, as a tomboy, and as daddy's little girl. There is still an element to this that is extremely dreamlike. A part of me refuses to believe I am standing here before you today. deliver a eulogy for my father. I've delivered speeches to crowds of over thousands, and this does not feel real. My dad was my unstoppable force, my first hero. My father was my guide to the world. His love for so many things, and anyone who knew him knew the millions of hobbies Dad always had going. And they were not just hobbies to him, they were his education to the world. But his love for the world, the physical, the spiritual world, and its connections, he taught me so much more than I'm sure he realized. He was my Zen master without knowing he was a Zen master who just cursed a whole lot. <laughs> my father was the one who taught me to explore and appreciate the world, encouraged me to read theoretical physics at the age of 14 to understand my expanding of the universe and my excitement. And this was after when I was much younger he was interested in geology and worked closely with the professor at College of the Siskiyous. He would take me with him on expeditions looking for trilobite fossils, geological field trips, and he would include me in college classes. I was only seven. This was in addition to numerous twilight fishing trips to Gumboot Lake, Lake Siskiyou, and of course Hampton Pond. Rowing on the lake with my dad was one of the safest places I felt. My first memories of my father were of him hunched over a Commodore 64, programming something in DOS for one of his computer classes. I was curious, and he didn't shoo me away, but invited me in and explained best he could to a five-year-old what he was doing. From there, he laid the tracks to Hubert, text-based quests, and teach me basic programming. But no matter what it was, he was always ready to educate me. Makes sense, it went to, I went into the field that I did. When strangely enough, it was the medical field and neuroscience that was my first love, which is a bit ironic in this situation, but he was always very happy with my choice. While my father may have been a confirmed Catholic, something I found out in just the last couple of months, which is a little funny to me because in all of our discussions about religion, he never once told me that. He raised me as more of a Buddhist. He wanted to teach me a way of life that was gentle and kind, full of mindfulness and awareness to everything around me, from a blade of grass to the ocean. Besides the creative and spiritual side that my dad had, I hold nothing but the utmost respect for my father because of what he went through as a 
child. Dad always encouraged me to stand up for myself, to fight for the things I believed in, no matter what. And this was because he was a fighter. This was one of the things I would talk to Dad about over the last three months. My father did something incredible. He was able to stop the cycle of physical, emotional, and verbal abuse that he had suffered as a child and not once create that environment for me. Very few people can successfully do that, and my father did. My dad also lost a child during his first marriage. His son was only four years old. And when my father rarely spoke of Eric again, dad was brave enough to have another child to go on and allow himself to joy again. And I have such admiration for my father's bravery. And I tell you this because a lot of you know him as more of a goofball or somebody who's grumpy at food or, or you know, um, involved in a project, but there was a lot more to him. And he survived so much, and he stopped such a major cycle, and he may have been no saint, but none of us are. And I think these experiences allowed my father to see and appreciate the beauty and wonder of things. It allowed him to expand his mind to see the connections in the universe not often understand, not often understood by many. It also built a strength in him, which sometimes did come out as stubborn, to put it mildly, to persist forward no matter what. In writing this and thinking back, I never once saw Dad give up unless he had to. Otherwise, he would solve a problem and he would keep going until it was done. He was one of the hardest working men I've ever known. In his retirement, his focus on beauty and wonder was seeming to come back more, none more so than in his photography. As his niece, Cindy, who couldn't be here today, said, he was one who captured many beautiful things through the lens of his camera. And if you look close and engage your mind, your soul and sight will capture beautiful detail, which he did that effortlessly. My dad could have been anything that he wanted to be. He was not encouraged to go to college, but had he, he could have become anything. His IQ was genius level. He was always taking extra college classes at COS when I was younger to expand his interest. And in retirement, he was teaching himself calculus, taking cooking classes to continue his journey towards a master chef, and reconnecting with his love of woodworking, to just name a few things. Dad strived and was successful in giving me the life that he did not have. He instilled in me to go for my dream, no matter what it was, and to keep going. I remember the look of joy and pride on his face when I told him I was going to get my master's degree. He was absolutely thrilled. One of my favorite memories of my father was when I was about nine years old. I was obsessed with the poet Shel Silverstein and his two books where the sidewalks ends and the light in the attic. Whenever dad and I were driving in the car, I would read his poems from the books. I would laugh hysterically as would dad. And now, dad has gone back into the universe, however you choose to see it. And there's a Shel Silverstein poem that I'd like to think that dad is up to because of course he has to keep busy. It's called Somebody Has To. Somebody has to polish the stars. They're looking a little bit dull. Somebody has to polish the stars. But the eagles and starlings and gulls have all been complained 
They're tarnished and worn. They say they want new ones, but we can't afford. So please get your rags and your polishing jars. For somebody has to go polish the stars. And this is how I like to picture him. Helping out by polishing the stars while grumbling under his breath. <laughs> if you're here today, we thank you for that. It means that he touched your life in one way or another. And it means that you'll miss him in one way or another. And yes, he will be missed. Friends and family will miss his corny jokes, his cooking, and his conversation. Jen will miss her best friend and her companion by her side. And I will miss my father. Losing my father is one of the most difficult things I have gone through. But as I'm standing here today, I realize how fortunate I was to have him. I will say I was honored and humbled to help take care of him these past few months and share moments like listening to Pink Floyd together, singing Amazing Grace to him for two hours one night, and just being able to hold his hand and be there in his final moments. And slowly but surely, I'm starting to hear that voice again. There's a quiet assurance that's coming back, that's saying, don't worry, kiddo. I'm right here. You can do it. To share one last story of Dad and his stubborn, silly sense of humor, I give you this tale. When Dad had his tracheotomy out, he started talking up a storm, which was great. Jen and I had gone down on a very rainy day to see him, and when we got there, he was in incredibly chatty, which was wonderful. Then an RN walked in and dad, shut up. She was thrilled to hear he was talking and asked dad what his name was. Dad glared, much like an obstinate preschooler at the ceiling, and refused to say anything. She continued her checkup and questioning while I started to prompt him to say his name. He looked at the ceiling eyes avoiding hers and mine and Jen's. Finally, we hear a scratchy sparky emerge from dad's mouth. The RN says, oh, your name is Sparky? Okay. She finishes her check and Jen walks over to dad and asks him, honey, what's your name? To which he clearly replies, Mark. Dad. <laughs> I leave you with a simple quote from Star Trek, which is another wonderful love that my dad and I shared and that he introduced me to. And this comes from the end of the original Wrath of Khan. And if you're familiar with the Wrath of Khan, I'm sorry. And McCoy is saying this to Kirk about losing Spock. He's not really dead as long as we remember him. And dad, there will never be a day where you will not be remembered. Thank you.